Well, Trinity family, we're excited. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be starting our annual coaches training. Uh, it is a 60-hour uh, certified training course. Uh, it is Christ-centered, biblically based. Uh, I wrote the curriculum. I will be the one facilitating. Some of you, maybe for the first time, you're hearing about this opportunity here at Trinity. Uh, for those of you that are familiar, a lot of corporations, it's a global movement, the coaching movement. There are people that are professional executive life coaches. And if you jump online and you uh, want to get that type of training, either because you simply want to grow personally or you want to grow as a leader uh, or you want to create a, a passive uh, stream of income for yourself or you want to launch a whole new career, these, these courses, the training of these courses, they're anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000. Uh, but because it's church-sponsored, we're able to offer it to our members at a ridiculously low price. And we cap it at about 25 people, and so we still have some slots available for this year's training. So if you'd like to inquire, you can jump online. Uh, and I also encourage you to jump online and do some uh, research as to coaches training uh, uh, services that are out there and just to kind of familiarize, familiarize yourself with what is available in comparison to what we're offering you. And we'd love for you to come and be a part of it. Uh, tonight's our banquet for a 25-year celebration of Heartline. We have some special guests that are in service. Uh, they're not, they, they are well known here, the Winkler family. Uh, Pastor Rob and Linda, please stand. And uh, they're here, Tasha, their daughter, she's also here. And we... We love and appreciate them, and uh, Pastor Rob was very instru instrumental in the formation of Heartline, was, was a part of the staff way back then when it came. Cody and Deborah, you all throw here. Hi, Cody, and see you guys on the stand up. Cody and Deborah. Cody was on staff, and Deborah was one of our former directors at Heartline. So uh, it's going to be a special, special evening. Thank you all for, for coming and being a part of this special celebration and for being in service uh, today. We're, we're wrapping up a series called Forward. We're in our, our fourth message. And uh, if you remember week one, we talked about wake up, wake up, wake up to what's available and wake up to what God has in store for us. We were out of Ephesians 5, where Paul said, awake, O thou sleeper, and let Christ, uh, his light shine upon you. Uh, and then the second week, we talked about moving forward in our series, forward, moving forward in the Spirit, by the Spirit. And we looked at that verse in Ephesians 5, where Paul said, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then last weekend, we talked about how freedom is movement, and we looked at one of the most popular verses in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we talked about the freedom that we have through and by the Holy Spirit. And then today, we're going to look at one of the most famous, possibly the most famous verse in the Bible related to freedom and moving forward in in the freedom that Christ offers all of us. Uh, maybe a lot of you aren't into the zombie genre of movies, but back in 2013, Brad Pitt uh, was in a movie called World War Z, this zombie apocalypse movie, and he was the protagonist, Jerry Lane. He was working for the UN, and he was the one responsible to try to save the world from this epidemic. And in that, in that movie, he has a statement that ba basically capsulizes the entire uh, movie itself. And it was this statement, movement is life. He actually says it in Spanish, movimiento es vida. He says that. And actually, that's the theme of the whole movie. movie. And that captures my attention because we've been talking about how movement is life. Last week, we talked about one of the symbols of freedom in America is the bald eagle, right? And that bald eagle soars it represents freedom, and it represents movement. We talked about the great and brilliant campaign of Southwest Airlines, ding, you're now free to move about the country. What makes it so brilliant is those two words that resonate with every American, free to move. We as Americans associate freedom with movement. Matter of fact, Aristotle, he said, life requires movement. How profound. Albert Einstein, he said, nothing happens until something moves. And one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, Jerry Seinfeld, <laughs> he even said, to me, if life boils down to one thing, it's movement. To live is to keep moving. As the great David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa said, when they asked him the question, are you prepared to go? He said, I'm prepared to go anywhere as long as it is forward. That needs to become your motto, my motto, our motto in life. We're prepared to go anywhere as long as it's forward. And I'm in the book of Exodus in my devotional reading, and in Exodus 14, you know, Moses is crying out to God, and God says, why are you crying to me? Tell my people to go forward. 
That's the message. Go forward. But you can't go forward if you're not free. And so what does it mean to be free? So let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 8. And out of respect, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. This is quite biblical. They did it in the day of Ezra. John, chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. So Jesus said to those Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings, and live in accordance with them, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's offspring, descendants, and have never been in bondage to anybody. Uh, What do you mean by saying you will be set free? Jesus answered them, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you, whoever commits and practices sin is the slave of sin. Now, a slave does not remain in a household permanently, forever. The son of the house does remain forever. So, if the son liberates you, makes you free men, then you are really and unquestionably free. Yes, I know that you are Abraham's offspring, Yet you plan to kill me because my word has no entrance, makes no progress, does not find any place in you. I tell you the things which I have seen and learned at my father's side, and your actions also reflect what you have heard and learned from your father. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the worship. We thank you now for the ministry of the word of God, the breaking of the bread of life. It will be distributed and it will find a home. It will enter and find a home and make progress in our lives for we will not, we refuse to simply be hearers of the word and not doers also. Bless your people as they receive your word now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, you may be seated. So movement is is life, and really, what does it mean to be a Christian? You know, if I if I asked you the question today, how many of you are Christians? About ninety percent of the hands would go up. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But what does that actually mean? Perhaps I could ask a better question to all of us that profess faith in Christ. What if I asked you the question, Are you a follower of Christ? You see, the essence of Christianity is just that. It means I'm a follower of Jesus Christ every day, every moment of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year for the rest of my life. I am a devout follower of Jesus Christ. It's not a one-time deal, right? Yes, being born again, we understand the theological understanding of what it means to be born again, and you become a brand new person in Christ Jesus, and, you know, we pray the sinner's prayer, and we understand that part of it. But to be a Christian means that we are continuing in His Word. We're continuing in His teachings. Then you are His disciple. Then you will know the truth. And only then will you be set free. So when Jesus said, if you want freedom, and if you truly believe in me, you're going to continue in my Word. What does it mean? It's an important question. What does it mean to continue in Christ's Word? It means at least three things. Number one, it means listening, listening to the truth. And what is truth? God's word. Jesus said in John 17, 17, he said, God's word, thy word is truth. So to be a disciple of Christ, to be a follower of Christ means we are listening to the truth. But not only are we listening to the truth, we are learning. And we are committed to continue to learn more and more and more about the truth. That's why 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So as Christ followers, we come to church regularly, consistently. We read our Bibles regularly, consistently. We're a part of Bible studies. We're a part of life groups. We're a part of the community and the life of a church. Why? Because it's not enough just to listen to the truth. We need to be committed to learn more and more of that truth to the level of truth that we know that we're learning, and that number three, we're living, will determine our freedom, our state of being spiritually free. So we're to listen, we're to learn, and then we're to live out that truth. As as the half-brother of Jesus, James, who wrote the book of James said, we're not simply hearers of the Word. We need to refuse to just be professional hearers of another sermon. Nobody needs another sermon or another Bible study on top of another Bible study if we're not living out that truth by the power of the Holy Spirit and by God's grace. So that's what it means to continue in Christ's Word. But then what does it mean to be a disciple? 
What is, Jesus said, if, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. That's the term, that's a technical, theological, accurate term that Jesus used to describe us, people who profess to follow him. So, if you continue my word, then you're my disciples. So, what does it mean to be a disciple? It means at least three things. Number one, it, mean, it means belief. To be a disciple of Jesus means you believe. He is who he said he was and is. And when Jesus was talking there in John 8, he said to the Jews who believed in him. So everything begins with faith in Christ, with a firm belief in him that Jesus is, number two, the truth, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we believe, we've accepted mentally, intellectually, in our minds and in our hearts, we've accepted the truth that Christ is the only way, that he is who he said he was, and we continue in Christ's teachings. The final authority in our life is what Christ taught and then what the apostles of Christ taught throughout the New Testament in the epistles. And then we'll know the truth, and then what happens, number three, to be a disciple, we believe, we, we embrace the truth, and that leads to freedom. That leads to this statement that Jesus made twice in the, in the section of Scripture that we read, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It leads to freedom. See, belief leads to truth, which leads to freedom, and that truth will make us free, set us free, and then keep us free. But when I use the term freedom, of course it resonates with every American, that's, because that's like our number one value as citizens of the United States of America. Everything was based on, everything was built on freedom. So what is freedom? Well, let me give you some quotes from some you know, highly intellectual historians and, and, and men of old. First of all, Lord Action, the great historian of freedom, defined freedom as the assurance that every man shall be protected in doing what he believes is his duty against the influence of authority and the majority's customs and opinion. So to be truly free, you're able to exercise what you believe to do and, and is right for yourself. Frederick Hayek, the British Aus Austrian economist, his, is, his definition of freedom is quite similar. The absence of a particular obstacle, coercion by other men. And then Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he said that freedom is the ability to choose between alternatives and to act in accordance with one's choices. So we kind of have a general agreement and understanding what it means to be a free people living in a free country, but when Jesus used the term freedom 2,000 years ago, what type of freedom was Jesus talking about? Jesus was talking about a spiritual freedom. And so what does it mean to be spiritually free? Here's my definition for you. It means the absolving of personal sin and the penalty of that sin resulting in something, resulting in the free exercise of one's will against the influence of evil and Satan's schemes in loving obedience to God and His holy commandments. To be truly a free man and a free woman, to be free in Christ means we are free to choose God's way, to choose God's will, to choose God over Satan, the kingdom of light over the kingdom of darkness, and to choose the path of righteousness against the path of unrighteousness. There is no power in hell. There is no demon strong enough, and Satan himself cannot influence us against God, against our will, because we are free men and free women in Christ. But here's the kicker. Here's the word that Jesus actually used there in John's Gospel, chapter 8, the Greek word. It's the Greek word, eutheretto, and it basically means this, to deliver and make free. When Jesus said, if you continue in my word, not start and stop, start and stop, start and stop, but if you continue in my word, the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? If we continue in the Word, God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, that if you want to be prosperous, if you want to be a success, you have to meditate upon the Word day and night. It can't depart from your mouth or from your heart. If you'll do that, you'll be a, if you continue in my Word, then you're my disciples, and then you'll know something. Boom! The lies of this world and the lies of the enemy will be broken. The spell, the mesmerizing, hypnotizing, satanic spell that's over the world and over most of the minds of the people living in the world will be broken over your life because you'll know the truth. Hallelujah. 
And that truth will set you free. It will deliver you. It will make you free. So freedom, as Jesus was, a, as he was applying it here in this section of Scripture, it basically means to be free means to not be a slave. It's the opposite of being bound. It's the opposite of being a slave. And what is a slave? A slave is someone who does not belong to him or herself, but belongs to someone or something else. Now we know in the history of our nation, all nations, no nation is perfect. No family is perfect. No company is perfect. No church is perfect. No life is perfect. If you're looking for perfection, it's in the next world. And if you're looking for perfection that came into this world, it happened only once. When Jesus, God in human form, came into this world. So there is no such thing as protection. Every nation has sin. The key is, do you acknowledge that sin, and do you rectify to the best of your ability that sin? America is guilty of two great evils. The, the two great evils that America is guilty of is, number one, the evil of slavery, and number two, the evil of abortion. Now, what, makes, what made and what makes slavery so evil? Listen, it's the enslavement of God's image bearers. Every human being, regardless of race, gender, nationality, color of skin, every living human being is a bearer of the image of God because all of us were created in the image and likeness of God. And abortion is the killing of God's image bearers. You see, both evils violated basic human rights. And our rights don't come from a government or from man. Our rights come from God. He's the one that created us. He's the one that fashioned us and, and set us apart in our mother's wombs. And these two evils, they sinned against our basic human rights. You see, in slavery... The owners of slaves dehumanized the slaves and made, it, made others believe that they were less human than they themselves. And in abortion, we devalue and dehumanize that baby. We call it a fetus. And we elevate the rights of a woman above the rights of a child. And just like we corrected the evil of slavery, I believe one day we will rectify the evil of sinning against God's image bearers who happen to be in a woman's womb. There's an old story of Abraham Lincoln that's told. One day he went down to the slave block to buy a slave girl. And there was a slave girl for sale, and she saw this tall white man and figured he was just another white man that was going to buy her to abuse her. And Abraham outbid everybody else, and he purchased this young slave girl. She was now legally his property. And when he took her from the slave block and they were walking, he said, you are now free, young lady. She said, free? What does that mean? He says, you are free. She said, does that mean I could say what I want to say? He said, yes. Does that mean that I could be whatever I want to be? He said, that's what that means. Does that mean that I could go wherever I want to go? He said, yes, you are free. That's what it means. She says, then I choose to go with you. To be truly free. What does it mean? As we mentioned last week, there's external freedom and internal freedom. And I said, many of you have friends or loved ones that are in prison right now, and on the outside, they're, they're locked up, they're bound, but on the inside, they've never been freer. And yet, there will be people in our services today who are free on the outside, but they are bound up in a prison of their own making on the inside. So you tell me, who is experiencing greater freedom? Those who have it on the outside? and not on the inside, or those who have it on the inside and not on the outside. Now granted, the best kind of freedom is to be free on the outside and to be free on the inside. But in the day of Jesus, when Jesus was talking about freedom, the religious leaders he was talking to got a little cocky, and they got a little arrogant. And once again, they said in verse 33, they were offended by the words of Jesus, by the way. They said, they answered him, we're Abraham's offspring, his descendants and have never been in bondage to anybody. What do you mean by saying, you will be set free? Let's hit the pause button for a second. Time out. These guys said, we're Abraham's descendants, and we've never been in bondage. Ah, uh, let's think about this for a second. The history of the nation of Israel, 
ah, I'm in the book of Exodus in my devotional reading. Hello, 400 plus years in bondage? What do you mean you've never been in bondage? After, after they got out of Egypt, eventually they went back into bondage to the Philistines. And then they sinned grievously against the Lord and were sent into exile in bondage to the Babylonians for 70 years. What's this? We're Abraham's descendants, and we've always been free. The very day that they were having this conversation with Jesus, they were under the rule and dominion of Rome. (laughs) You know, sometimes people think they're free. They're not so free. And even Jesus... God in human form, right? The freest person that's ever walked the face of the earth, right? He did not even have complete, total external freedom. He was under the the rule of Rome ultimately, and ultimately, by God's design, Rome issued his death sentence, which he could have rejected. He had 12 legions of angels that he could have called upon. We understand all that. He was still subjugated to as an outcast of the religious powers that existed at the time that Christ was in this world. And yet, there's never a man more free than Jesus. Even as he stood before Pilate on that fateful day when Pilate was about to to, uh, give the death sentence, Pilate said, don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I have the power of life and death? And he's like, you don't have anything that hasn't been given to you by my Father which is above. And I am a king but my kingdom is not of this world. Basically, he was saying, but one day it will be. And the only reason you're able to go through with a decision you're about to go through is because it is my Father's will. Jesus was free completely and totally. And he was looking at people that were bound on the outside, and they didn't even know it, and more importantly, they were bound on the inside. And what Jesus was offering them was not initially external freedom, freedom from Rome. That's what they wanted, because Messiah would come. They, as they understood the Old Testament prophecies, he was going to establish the Davidic dynasty once again, would be resurrected, and, and then he would defeat the Romans, and then he, God's kingdom on the earth once again, his will as it is in heaven. But not yet. Jesus was offering spiritual freedom, because that's the freedom that matters most. Now, we understand freedom, right? We're Americans. We understand national freedom, which is a nation's sovereign ability to exercise its self-determined course in relation to other nations. And we can never lose our national freedom, our sovereignty. We can never hand it over to the United Nations. And then we understand political freedom. It's the freedom that each citizen should possess within that nation, and those freedoms are under great attack and have been now for a generation. And then there's individual personal freedom. We must never forfeit that. We must never give that up. And I plead with all you young millennials, let me say something to you. There is nothing admirable. There is nothing attractive when it comes to socialism. Please become a student of history and understand that socialism always leads to communism. And communism was the greatest instrument of mass murder the world has ever known. It's a dangerous, slippery slope for you to forfeit your individual freedom and rights and give it to a a specific class, a ruling class of people who who play God in our lives and believe that they exist to take care of you and take care of me. God takes care of you. God takes care of me. And with God's help, we take care of ourselves. And you should only govern by the consent of the people. That's what a republic is. All right, pop quiz. Pop quiz. You have something to write down. I want you to write this down. How many of you in here can give me, let's say, five members of the Kardashian family? Oh, I know. There's Chloe. There's Kim. There's. Okay, okay. Now, write down the five individual freedoms afforded us in the First Amendment as, 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 as citizens of the United States of America. Ah, uh, what'd you say? What's an amendment? Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Like, our country, we know all the, I know all the family members and their babies too. <laughs> that's, why, that's why we're in the mess we're in. First Amendment. All right, so uh, what, what's, one of, what's one of the freedoms that we have in, in the First Amendment? Come, somebody. Oh, freedom of speech. Every service, 
Every service said that. Last night, classic service, one guy said, the right to bear arms. I said, that's the Second Amendment. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> that's Texas. That's like the First Amendment, right, the Texas. <laughs> How many have their guns with them today? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, but the first freedom mentioned in the First Amendment, freedom of religion, hallelujah. That you are free to worship God or not worship God, that's a personal freedom. <laughs> freedom of speech, and there's the freedom of the press, and then there's the freedom to peaceably assemble, and then there's the freedom to redress a grievance with the government that is to govern by consent of the majority of the people. That's the First Amendment. Freedom. But listen, freedom is not the same as autonomy. Freedom is not, not that I can do what I want, when I want, as much as I, I want, where we become a law unto ourselves. Pope John Paul II, he was one of the really good popes. He said, freedom consists not in doing what we like, but in having the right to do what we ought. Dr. Viktor Frankl, one of the greatest thinkers, psychiatrists, that's ever existed. He, he survived three Nazi death camps, made many famous statements and wrote many famous books. He said this, he said, a statue, a statue of responsibility should be established in the West Coast to complement the Statue of Liberty in the East Coast. To be free means to be responsible, to be governed by God's law. Because Lau Fillmore said, liberty unregulated by law degenerates into anarchy. So understand this, there are three stages to freedom. There's a diagram I want to show you, three stages to freedom, all right? Freedom has to be one, and then that freedom has to be ordered so that that freedom can be sustained. All right, in the history of the United States of America, we declared our independence Jan July 4th, 1776. We declared, we are a free people, we will be self-governed, no longer under King George the, the third or second, whatever. We will exercise our right. And most of the time, unfortunately, freedom is not gained by negotiation. It's not gained by pleading. It's not gained by handing out flowers. Unfortunately, that's the reality of a fallen world. Get used to it. That's the history of this world. Get used to it. So we had to fight a bloody war. Eight, nine, 11 years, the Revolutionary War. We defeated this ragtag bunch of farmers and plowmen, we defeated the most powerful military force the world had ever seen to that day. We defeated them, and we won our freedom. Then we had to order our freedom. Okay, now we're a free people. How are we going to be governed? Under God, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. We had to order that freedom. Why? So that we could do what no country, no nation has ever been able to, to achieve, the sustaining of that freedom. Rome fell after 400 years. Even the nation of Israel, they were bound for 400 years and plus years in Egypt. They, they couldn't even get out of the promised land. That generation, God could get, Egypt out of, could get them out of Egypt, but couldn't get Egypt out of them. So they all die. That generation, they all die in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. But before they entered the promised land, God through Moses gave them the law. Because now they're a free people. How are they to live as a free people under God's law? Ten holy commandments. 613 laws in the Old Testament, civil, moral, hygiene laws by which the nation of Israel could be governed so that they could sustain their freedom. But even when they got to the promised land, they weren't able to sustain their freedom. They kept falling away from God, going back into bondage. He'd set them free. They'd fall away from God, go back into bondage. He'd set them free. That's been the story. That's the story of all civilizations. We're a young country, and we've, we've been free for, what, 270-plus years. How much longer how much longer can we sustain that freedom? Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago, he won your freedom by the shedding of his own blood. And then he ordered that freedom through his teachings, through his apostles, through the New Testament. Because now we're free men and free women in Christ, but now we need to live according to Christ's teaching. So if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and that truth will not only set you free, it will keep you free. Because Christ, the goal of Christ, the, the purpose, the mission, the heart of God is for you and I to remain free men and free women. Look at Galatians 5.1. Let's read it out loud together. Christ has freed us so that we may enjoy the benefits of freedom. Therefore, be firm in this freedom and don't become slaves again. Because whom the Son sets free 
is completely and totally free indeed. So what is Christ's freedom? In closing, it's three things. Number one, we're free from sin. We're free from sin and the penalty of sin. Read Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8 in light of I'm free from sin. And oh, Paul goes into great depth in these chapters of the book of Romans. They say that the book of Romans is the Christian constitution. One of the most important books of all of the New Testament is the book of Romans for that simple fact. It is the Christian's constitution. And then we're free from Satan and from Satan's dominion and Satan's domain. We are free. We're no longer blinded by the God of this world. And Jesus said, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You shall trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. We have authority. We are free from sin, and we are free from Satan, which, number three, means that we truly are free, and we can be free from the greatest enemy, free from self. You know, trouble travels in threes. Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, world, flesh, and the devil. Sin, Satan, and self. Trouble travels in threes, but victory travels in three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But let me tell you something. The greatest enemy you'll fight, it's not sin. It's not your neighbor. It's not even Satan. He's defeated. Self. It's me, myself, and I. Trouble travels in threes. Me, myself, and I. The Bible says it's no longer I that lives, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God. And we must die to self daily. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We have so many professing Christians in the body of Christ today. We need true, heartfelt men and women that say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I continue in his word, and I follow his teachings. True story. I'll end with this. During World War II, there were uh, a plane that was shot down, and, and the men in the plane fell into enemy hands, and they were taken to a POW camp in Germany, a, a death camp, Nazi, one of the Nazi prisoner of war camps. The, Brit, the, the British soldiers were kept in one camp, a fence separated with, with attack dogs between that fence, and then the Americans on the other side. But every day, one represented from the American side and one represented from the, the English side would come to talk at the fence, and they would talk in the ancient Gaelic language. The Germans couldn't decipher it. What the Americans had was more important than food and provisions. They had a homemade radio. And they were able to listen to the news about the progress of the war. And one day, all of a sudden, all the Americans in the American side of the camp were jumping and screaming and shouting for joy. And the representative left to go tell the British, the English side, what had just, they had just heard on that homemade radio that the Allied forces had just defeated the axis of evil and pow- of the powers of the, of the German uh, uh, war machine, and that Germany had capitulated, that they, that they had thrown in the towel, that they had given up, and that they were now free men. And they rejoiced, and the German guards hadn't heard the news yet. They didn't know what was going on. For three days, they knew something that those German guards did not know, that they were free men. And any day now, the American military would come and would set them free. And the final night, right before the next day when the troops came, the German soldiers got word that the, that the war was over. They fled that prison camp, leaving the gates and the doors unlocked, and they fled in the night and into the wilderness. And the very next day, the American troops came and set all those men free. You know, we've got the news of what Jesus did on the third day when he rose from the dead, and we know now that we are free men and free women, and we are simply waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It can happen any time, any day, and we are rejoicing because whom the sun sets free is truly free, truly free. How free are you? So many in our country are slaves to debt. Slaves to drugs or slaves to alcohol or slaves to worldly carnal pleasures of all types. Christ came so that we could be free and stay free. 
And that's why we need one another. That's why we need to never face a struggle alone. There are others who have gone through that same struggle or similar struggle, and they're on the other side of that struggle. They're singing the praises of God, and they're walking in victory, and those people can help us find that same victory. And that's why we need to do life together. That's why we need to take advantage of the ministries that are available here at Trinity, because there are men and women and staff and volunteers leading those ministries who've had the same struggles or similar struggles or maybe going through some of the similar struggles that you're going through. But there's a way out. God's power, God's strength, and the support of a loving church family, we're going to make it because whom, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. There's a song I want to end this service with. It's a reflective song about freedom. I just want you to sit there. I want you to listen, and then I'll come back, and I'll close. we'll close in prayer together. It would feel to be free I wish I could break all the chains holding me I wish I could say all the things that I should say Say them loud, say them clear for the whole Every head bowed, please, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. These are not just words, ancient words spoken 2,000 years ago. These are eternal, living words, the words of Jesus, the living Lord and Savior himself. That if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free and set you free. Lord, thank you that we are free men and free women, that our freedom was purchased for us 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. We will not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage, the bondage of religion or the bondage of sin, the bond bondage of our old way of thinking and our old way of living. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Everything's become brand new. Thank you for the newness that we have in Christ Thank you that our minds and hearts, the chains have been broken in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus said, you must be born again. He said, well, why do I need to be born again? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of those sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you're here and you need to rededicate your life to Christ, 
Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The Father loves you, and the Father is ready to receive you into his eternal kingdom. Pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family? <laughs>